Good evening. Jon Snow has been the main presenter of Channel 4 News since 1989. That's 32 years as the face of our programme, the face of facts, authority and empathy for decades. He has cemented his place as a legend and icon of broadcast journalism. And let's face it, a national treasure. It's overwhelming. But as 2021 comes to an end, so too does Jon Snow's time at Channel 4 News. And so today we look back at just a few of the many, many highlights of his incredible career. From interviewing Nelson Mandela. Apartheid committed so many crimes. Let bygones be bygones. To reporting on the fall of the Berlin Wall. There continues to be an extraordinary atmosphere in this city tonight. As we celebrate a man who's been at the front line of history for nearly half a century. From Channel 4 News, this is The Forecast. So, John, we're coming to the end of your time here at Channel 4 News, and it's been an amazing career, and it's impossible to do that whole career here at Channel 4 News justice, but we're going to try our best. So, today we're going to look at some of our favourite moments with Jon Snow, with Jon Snow. Now, you joined ITN in 1976, and you met Idi Amin, the leader of Uganda, many times during that decade when he was in power. Let's play the clip of your interview with Idi Amin. In your interest in British affairs... I know that you're interested in and indeed actually go along with much of what Mr Enoch Powell has been saying recently. He does not want England to be colonised by Africa, by Asia. And do you agree with that? London for Londoners, Scotland for Scottish, Mm. Wales for Welsh. Well, Uganda for Ugandans. uh, Uganda for Uganda, Rhodesia for Zimbabwean people not for the white minority regime. What was it like interviewing him? He seems quite, you know, laid back, relaxed, commanding. Not menacing at all. Uh, And yet he could be, but he wasn't with me. Um, What strikes me about that clip is who that other chap was. (laughs) That young, handsome man. Was I really as ridiculous as that, with that long hair and that posh voice? Perhaps my voice still is posh, posh, I don't know. Uh, But Idi Amin... um, Yeah, I mean, he was a very moody bloke and you never knew quite what form he was in. And if he was in a menacing form, you could easily say the wrong thing and he'd be carted off to jail. So you were very careful about what you said. But actually, there was nothing very illogical about what he was saying. Were you ever scared of him? I mean, he's a notorious figure. And you couldn't help but be scared knowing what he'd done. I mean, he'd had a lot of people killed and he had himself sort of come to power with the gun. No, he just was a fairly brutish sort of character. And having met him a number of times, do you think you formed some sort of, not friendship, but he trusted you? I don't really know whether he really knew that this chap that kept turning up was the same person. (laughs) You know, I mean, I don't know if he really remembered me each time. Um, But maybe I was one of the few white men that sort of said, because I had lived in Uganda before, I'd done voluntary service overseas, lived there for a year on the banks of the Nile. And um, I think he liked that fact. But I, I honestly cannot say that I could speak for either his sanity uh, or precisely who he really was. Now, Idi Amin, he was removed from power in 1979. And that same year, the Shah in Iran was ousted and Ayatollah Khomeini came into power and you were there. Let's look back at a clip from that time. Yesterday's demonstration was the nearest thing to an anti Khomeini rally yet. The imposition of Islamic law here has started with an order to women to cover their heads in government offices. Many are furious. Only a minority in Tehran already follow the instruction. But the issue has provided an escape valve for many of the men here who for days have been spoiling for trouble. Led by a few Islamic zealots, several hundred men eventually attacked the protesters. Several of the women who stood their ground with considerable courage were stabbed as they chanted slogans for equal rights. Most of these men can be relied upon to have a gun at home, and if they can't persuade the women and other sectors who oppose extremist Islamic beliefs, then the danger is that they will bring their weapons out onto the street and that there will be bloodshed again. What was it like at that time? I mean, had you been to Iran before, or was that your first time? I had. Time? I'd driven to India uh, as a student uh, in a bus. I was one of the drivers, and we, we took, took a rock 
group to India. Oh, wow. um, and we played all the way along. There was a whole lot of universities joined in this thing. There were lots of buses and all that. So it was a mad uh, thing. But it, it enabled me to be in Iran as a civilian mm -hmm. uh, before all this. And I loved the country, absolutely adored it. And wonderful people too. And the revolution was a real, um, I mean, nobody loved the Shah, that's true. But, well, except the West who used to get his oil. But um, th there was something about Iran which was utterly captivating. A very sophisticated society. It's quite extraordinary that it's, you know, taken the turn that it has. The very, very bright people and, and delightful too, very friendly. So the revolution was a sudden shock and you actually felt quite paranoid in it. I mean, you didn't know when they might turn the gun on you. But it will go down as one of the most treasured countries that I ever went to. And, and what is it? I mean, you've touched on it a bit there, but, you know, you do have a long love, a long connection with Iran. And, and you went there, actually, I think, just before the pandemic. Well, no, actually, I was, the amazing thing is the pandemic broke out while I was there. Mm. And I only found out because I was in Isfahan on the bridge there, a place with many, many arches. And I suddenly saw a lot of people with non-religious white bandages across their, their mouths. And I began to ask people what was going on. And they told me there was an epidemic of, you know, of proportions. And here we are in it. But you still had that connection, that love of Iran when you went recently. I as did. You did that I did. Then. And I what did. is it in particular? It, I mean, it's a culture. It's a complete culture. It's very clearly a very old civilization. And though it has a bad reputation now uh, as sort of a place of hotheads and the rest of it, although it's got a bit better, um, and the revolution upset the West because the West had so much oil there and all the rest of it, um, it goes back far beyond anything we know in Europe. It's a seriously old civilization, and I mean civilization. During that revolution, there was also the hostage crisis, with the Americans from the embassy held captive for more than a year. That dented Jimmy Carter, the then president's approval ratings. Some say it led to his defeat. And the hostages were, in fact, released on the day Ronald Reagan was inaugurated. Now, you met both those presidents. I don't mm. know if you could tell me a bit about meeting both of them, Jimmy Carter, Ronald Reagan, two very different individuals. Yes, Carter was a really lovely man. Mr. President, we are live on British television news now. I wonder if we could ask you what you see as the most crucial achievement of your period here. Well, the most important to me... You didn't feel in any sense intimidated by his being president. He was a very human and decent guy, and it's sad that his... His regime, if you like, it was, was so tarred by the hostage crisis. I mean, Americans held captive for so long uh, in the embassy. Reagan? <laughs> well, Reagan was an actor, let's face it, and he acted the president, and, and he acted it awfully well. Your aides say that you're very upbeat as you uh, move towards this summit, yet it's not been a good week for the person we've come to know as the great communicator. Is there any sense in which you feel something's happened to the great communicator in the last 10 days or so? No, I've had four years of fighting with... He never struck one as a particularly political individual, although he was relatively right-wing. But nevertheless, he was attractive to the American electorate precisely because he played the part so well. And Reagan famously said at the Brandenburg Gate in 1987, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. And two years later, it did indeed come down. But you again were there, John. Yeah. Um, one of the pivotal moments of the 20th century. Let's play a clip from that moment. Hello, good evening from Berlin. There continues to be an extraordinary atmosphere in this city tonight. You join us here at the Berlin Wall after a day in which still more crossing points have been punched in it. The authorities here in West Berlin are saying that a quarter of the entire population of East Germany have now crossed into the city. That's four million people, of whom just 8,000 have actually stayed. I mean, at moments like that, I assume you realise that, you know, after all the years of the Cold War, wow, this is history right now. This is incredible. Is that what you feel at the time? And how do you reflect that in your reporting? Unquestionably. I mean, it was absolutely clear to anybody that this was a 
total turning point. I mean, when you've grown up, I was born after the war, but not that long after the war. So the war loomed over my childhood and people's fear of war and their experiences of war. And the Berlin Wall became symbolic, in a sense, of that war and of the failure of the West to resolve a proper peace that would have meant that East and West... And after all, East and West actually fought together. The idea they should be divided by a wall um, was a real tragedy. Uh, But uh, we were none of us who were there in any doubt that this was one of the greatest moments in history, modern history anyway, uh, the the fact that the ball was finally brought down uh, and actually without many casualties. And it was also, it came as a bit of a surprise at the time, didn't it? It did, it did. Were you sort of unprepared for it in a way? Very, very. I mean, I, I don't think anybody had plotted what to do if the wall came down because it wasn't one of the things you ever bothered with because it wasn't going to happen. And it did. It happened. And it was utterly intoxicating to be there. I, I mean, it was glorious. It, was, you, it buoyed everybody. Everybody felt so joyous. And what was it like reporting then in terms of trying to capture that? Or is it quite easy to capture that when it's, it's so evident? I think, you know, in a funny sort of way, the words come to you because... Um, it, it was just such an obviously glorious and incredible moment. And the people expressed it so beautifully. Was it a real period then of, um, of hope? I think it really was. And I, I, think, I think the world felt a safer place thereafter. And I think it, it still has a resonance today. And in that same regard, a few months after the wall fell, in February 1990... We had another defining moment when Nelson Mandela walked free from prison. We did. You sat down and interviewed him in 1994 during the elections, the first free elections. Explain meeting him to me before we play the clip. Well, I just need to do a little bit of a backstory because I was actually thrown out of university uh, because I challenged, uh, well, I was with a whole group of people who challenged the, the university's decision to have as their chancellor. Uh, Lord Salisbury, who was very closely associated with white uh, supremacy. Mm -hmm. And the idea that a black president in my lifetime would come to power in South Africa was an utterly incredible moment because none of us ever thought it could happen. The West seemed vested in having a white minority rule uh, in South Africa, diamonds and all the rest. It was such a rich still is such a rich country in terms of minerals and the rest of it. This man, and this man with such humility and, and joy, uh, bringing into that equation was absolutely incredible. And the idea that I was going to sit down with him, I couldn't believe it. And I thought, I'll be tongue-tied. What on earth am I going to say to him? But he just completely put you at ease. He was the most human person you could imagine. And in a funny sort of way, he didn't feel like somebody who'd suffered so long in prison and the rest of it. He felt to the manner born. Mm. He was, you know, a really gracious, lovely, powerful man. And he took it with great dignity and simplicity. You asked him in your interview about apartheid and its crimes. Let's hear that clip. That's what I wanted to pick you up on, this question of the pressure that everybody has exerted, but also the fact that apartheid committed so many crimes, uh, or so many crimes were committed in the name of apartheid. What should happen to people who committed those crimes? I have been saying uh, throughout, let bygones be bygones. Let what has happened pass as something unfortunate, but uh, which we must forget. What an incredible statement. A man who'd suffered so much. Let bygones be bygones. Imagine his bygones. Imagine parking, forgiving those bygones and living on to set such an example to the world, not just to South Africa. You were getting quite emotional watching it. It's just incredible to see him uh, again. I haven't seen him for a long time. I mean, on film, let alone in the flesh. 
And uh, yeah, it's a very, very important moment in my life, probably one of the most important moments in my reporting career. And has it stayed with you ever since? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, you know, it's sort of simplistic, this student marching around in the streets begging for majority rule in South Africa, and then it happening, and then you going to meet the man who brings it about. It's a bit of a, bit of a dream, isn't it? I guess I'm intrigued by your, like, as a journalist, you have to be impartial. I'm completely but, impartial. <laughs> impartial but, you're, but there is an emotional pull to it all. And so I wonder, you know, the emotional ties we have to stories. Does it become quite difficult sometimes to, to be impartial when the emotion there is so raw? I think South Africa was one of those situations in which, and apartheid in particular, in which you could not browbeat yourself into being totally objective and saying, well, you know, on the one hand, on the other. It just could not be dealt with like that. It was, it, I mean, in a sense, it was like the Nazis in Germany. I mean, it, it was an unforgivable crime. And, uh, you know, it, it was a terrible scar on humanity uh, that it was allowed to last so long. Um, and it was only relieved by the sheer spiritual power of one man, above all. And how did it feel in 2013 when you were there, when he passed? By then, wounds were beginning to heal. Um, it was becoming a more tolerant society, but many of the old forces were still knocking around. There was a pride, I think, in all races, in what had been achieved by this one man. And therefore, it was an easier time to be there, but a harder one to bury the man. I want to now briefly move away from politics and look at your reporting on natural disasters over the years. And one in particular, I want to look at Hurricane Katrina that struck Louisiana and, of course, New Orleans in 2005. And here's a clip of you with the police on a search boat. In two boats with police aboard, we crisscrossed several square miles of District 7 and never encountered another search boat. The inundation has covered more than 100,000 dwellings. Some of the dead are in these attics. We picked up a young man who said his grandfather was at home dying. The police officers were from Ohio. They were taking no chances. White police officers rescuing frightened black residents sets up its own resonances. Crumbs. I'd forgotten that. I mean, you used to live and work in the US um, in the 1980s for ITN. What was it like... I was be based in Washington, yeah. Yeah, what was it like being in America, this superpower, first world nation, brought to its knees like that? Well, it was a kind of visitation of the inevitable. I mean, you couldn't see, in a way, being prepared for it by having worked in South Africa... The idea that you could oppress people with poverty, in a sense, simply because they were black, had some of the, uh, you know, the issues that came about during apartheid. Um, you know, humanity is a combination of races and, and ethnicities and, and the rest of it, and sexual orientation and whatever. And the world only works if at its core is tolerance. And where you see intolerance, um, you have to shout it out. As a reporter, you have an obligation to. That's our right and our power. I feel honoured, really, in a sense, to have been in both South Africa and America when these issues were so completely at the top of the priority list. So in a way... They still are, in a way. And in a way, Katrina, it was in a way, shocking because that inequality had always been there. And it yes. took something like that to really bring it out. Absolutely. It, it painted a picture of all that was wrong with America. Um, of course, there were so many things that were right about America, but race was an overburdening crisis for America. I mean, the remnants of it are still very much there. But a start has been made. In the way that before you were saying you have a deep affinity with Iran, 
What are your feelings towards America, having lived, worked there, and reported on it so much? America is a, is a very difficult thing to sum up. I mean, on the one hand, there's, there's envy, because they, it's the can-do society. They can do anything. Uh, on the other hand, it's so distressing that, you know, in a sense, there is still a racial element to it all, that, that although there are some very successful black people, the truth is it's still dominated by a white um, race. And it'll take years, I think, for true equality ever to dawn. Now, John, last time we spoke on this podcast, it was about 9-11 hmm. and its aftermath. Hmm. And terrorism has dominated reporting journalism in the last 20 years. And shortly after I joined Channel 4 News, six years ago, I had to edit an interview you did from the Paris terrorist attacks in 2015. And you spoke to a doctor named Louise who witnessed those attacks and who tried to help people. Let's play that interview. I don't know, it must have lasted at least five minutes, maybe ten. Uh, and when it was over, what, what did you do? So there was a moment of, of uh, shock, of nothingness, and then uh, we came out of the underneath the tables. I was like seeing that my friends I was with were okay. And then I went a bit further up the bar and saw all the bodies uh, scattered. When you interview someone like that who's describing an unimaginable moment in their life, and you often have to do it with loads of people from th throughout your career. How difficult is it? Or do you feel you get better at it? Or, you know, how does one approach that? I think the most important quality any reporter has to have is empathy. Is somehow to get into what the other has experienced and, and try to reach into that and have them teach us about what they've suffered. And, and that is enormously difficult. Uh, and I must have struggled to achieve it and still haven't um, all my reporting career. Somehow she did trust me for some reason and she allowed herself to be very emotional. But we got a great sense of what she was suffering and what she'd seen. Let's come back to this country, finally. And in 2017, there was the Grenfell fire. 72 people died. You were on the ground the days after. And there was a real anger from the community. Let's watch that clip. Good evening from West London. That's it. The devastated homes of hundreds of families. We are in Kensington, Chelsea tonight, the richest borough in Great Britain. One of the wealthiest places on earth. Yet in spite of that, Last night, a fire ripped through this tower block behind me, spreading rapidly in a way that experts say simply cannot happen. And yet it did. Tonight, we're live from a community still reeling from what has happened and struggling to come to terms with what it witnessed and suffered. I mean, we've been talking about tragedies. Do you think I went over the top? No, not at all. OK. I also remember when you were out on the ground with your microphone and people were rushing over and shouting. You know, there was a real anger in that community at the time, wasn't there? This symbolises the divide between the rich and poor in this area. Yeah, because yeah, they don't care. Have you seen the difference between Chelsea and you come down here? It's the same borough. It's, it's the, the same, same borough, borough, but the divide is ridiculous. They don't care. There's a great deal of anger around here. Is that because you feel really absolutely like neglected over yeah. these? People had to stand there and watch friends and family die. Anger and distress, absolutely. Did you know that ha that had always been there? Or do you think, again, as we no, were talking about... No, I mean, I think that... the terrible thing is we had no sense of it at all. Mm. And, and in a sense, that's our pain too, which is still the continuing inequality in our country. It's better than it was. Mm. We are progressing gradually, but it's a very gradual and an awful long way to go. Because I guess throughout this whole interview, we've been talking about inequalities elsewhere. Yeah. And in some ways, we've sort of here forgotten about the inequalities in our, our own here. backyard. Absolutely. And, and, and it was a, a terrible thing for people looking in on Britain to see. Because I think they thought 
And we didn't have those sort of problems, but we did. Do you think and it was a defining moment? I do, yes, I do. And I guess finally, you know, this is the end of your time at Channel 4 News, but this is not the end of Jon Snow. So what is next? Well, I'd like to make some documentaries and I'd like to look more, more deeply at, at inequality if I can. But um, I hope I got the energy to do that. I'm sure you do. And after all these years at Channel 4 News and at ITN, do you feel wiser? No. You don't? I don't. I mean, I feel I've witnessed a great deal. I hope I've learned something, but I've still got a huge amount to learn. We all have. I think we have to keep challenging ourselves and allow what we learn on the ground as reporters uh, to inform what we know about how our society is set. There's still more to do. John Snow, thank you so much. And that was your life at Channel 4 News. <laughs> well, thank you very much. A part of it. <laughs>